Louis Torres Jr. is our speaker tonight from the University of Florida. He um, he was here four months ago, About September. Yes. Yeah. And we welcome him back. He came uh, with, with not too much notice when we had another speaker who, uh, um, uh, Mr. Latassi, had his hip replaced. So thank you. Please come on up. Welcome him again. Long drive from Gainesville. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Louis Torres. I'm a second year PhD student at the University of Florida, an invertebrate paleontologist from the Florida Museum of Natural History. Now, of course, I'm an invertebrate paleontologist now, which means I mostly study things like snails, clams, and sea urchins in a conservation paleobiology context, meaning I just take a look at the fossils to determine what past ecosystems look like in order to help with modern conservation efforts. Okay. But during my master's degree, I was a little bit more of a just general vertebrate paleontologist. Okay, I got turned over to the dark side, unfortunately, uh, after my master's. But today we're reaching a little bit further back with my you know, knowledge of Florida megafauna. And we're going to be talking about essentially the evolutionary history, adaptations, and sort of the pressures that led these different proboscideans to develop these different adaptations. So without further ado... We're gonna go ahead and get started with a group of animals that sit just outside of Proboscidea. Okay, we're gonna be talking about, of course, the dugongs, manatees, and hyraxes. Now, both these groups of animals I find honestly quite adorable, uh, especially the manatees and the dugongs. And initially, I thought hyraxes were pretty adorable as well. They're about cat size, okay, and they look like you'd take a mix between a mere cat and a guinea pig. Uh, I thought that I stopped thinking where they were cute when I saw this picture. Uh, <laughs> looks like a chupacabra almost. Uh, but luckily they stick to, you know, northern parts of Africa, you know, so you have to kind of go seek them out. Uh, but they have a very similar niche to uh, like a lot of pikas or rabbits would, uh, except instead of having the sort of claws that we see with those lamniforms and with those other sorts of rodents, uh, these guys had just pads on their feet and sort of more reminiscent of the nails of these proboscideans and the sirenians. Now, of course, when I talk about proboscideans, I'm, of course, talking about elephants and their relatives. And the only three uh, extant proboscideans are, of course, the three different species of elephants. You, of course, have the African bush elephant, otherwise known as Loxodonna africana, as you can see here, reaching over 13 feet tall, biggest specimen, and around 10 and a half tons in weight, followed by Loxodonna cyclotus, the African forest elephants, reaching about just under 10 feet tall, around seven tons, and then finally the Asian elephant, like you can see over here, reaching over 11 feet tall and seven tons in weight. Now, when I'm mentioning these sizes, okay, I want you guys to keep in mind that these are like the Shaquille O'Neal's of their species, okay? These are extraordinary sizes for these individual species, and they, that is not typical, okay? Uh, like, if we talk about humans, okay, I'm a little bit taller than average, right? But Shaquille O'Neal is still significantly bigger than me. He stands at seven foot one, around 350 pounds, and I'm about five foot 11 to six foot, determining whether you go by my license or what I tell you. Okay. <laughs> now listen, okay, I'm five foot 11 and three quarters. By the rounding rule, I should be six foot, you know, but apparently you don't hit that mark. They don't, they don't let you fudge the numbers a little bit. Anyway, now of course, they weren't the only proboscideans that have ever existed, as I'm sure you all are aware. Uh, it also includes animals like mastodons and mammoths. But something that's interesting is that all the living elephants are not technically closely related to each other. In fact, while the two African elephants are the closest living species to each other, or the closest uh, relatives, the living closest relatives are, excuse me, the closest relatives of Asian elephants were actually the mammoths, okay? And so Asian elephants are more closely related to mammoths than they would be to African elephants. And in fact, and you can see here, this is a uh, simplified elephant family tree. And if we take a look all the way at the bottom here, for, most of, for those of you who can see that, you can see on one branch of the true elephants, or the elephantids, you've got the African and straight tusk elephants, and on the other branch, the mammoths and the Asian elephants. But another group of proboscideans that people often confuse with mammoths are the mastodons. Now the mastodons are, of course, a little bit further back in the family tree, if we take a look at this here, while well, you've got your true elephants down here, the mastodons are all the way up here. They diverged away from the lineage that would lead to elephants around 25 to 27 million years ago. And we can actually tell this just based off the similarities of the teeth. For the most part, you can see here that 
the mammoths and the elephants have sort of washboard-like teeth with multiple smaller loafs all lined in a row. And while mastodons do have these sort of row-like teeth, they're more bunodont, essentially meaning that they're a little bit more lumpy, right? Similar to human or pig teeth, although we have a lot fewer, or a lot fewer cusps on our teeth than these mastodons do. And of course, when they get worn down, they are a little bit more reminiscent of elephant teeth, but they're still significantly different. And it's thought that these guys were actually, or it's not thought, it's known that these guys were actually significantly more squat and heavy than your elephants or mammoths of similar sizes. It's thought that if you took a 10 foot tall mastodon and you took a 10 foot tall mammoth, the mastodon would be about 80% heavier. Okay, these guys were robust, they were meaty, which is probably why the Paleo Indians loved eating them so much. Okay, now going finally to the beginning of the Proboscidean family tree, you can of course see you got the KPG mass extinction here 66 million years ago, runs all the way to Common Era, which is essentially a fancy word for modern day, starting around 60 million years ago, you can get your earliest proboscideans. And these guys, you can see, are very reminiscent of hyraxes, okay? They're relatively small. Again, they're about the same size as the hyraxes you see today. And, you know, they pretty much only existed in northern parts of Africa. You know, I believe the only places that this animal has been discovered is in Morocco, okay? Now, Erytherium, Right? Again, about the size of a cat and phosphotherium a few million years later, about 58 to 56 million years ago, is getting about small dog sized. Now, something that's really interesting about these early proboscideans, which gives us insights into sort of the social standings of other proboscideans, is that they were already dimorphic. What does dimorphic mean? Well, dimorphic just means that there's differences between the sexes. Okay? And these organisms, it was found that males are already significantly bigger than the females. This is a pattern we see with pretty much all of the proboscideans that we have fossil records for, and even in modern proboscideans, right? With all those large sizes, all the big sizes, I will be telling you guys for these individuals are mo most of the time going to be the males. And so what this tells us is that it probably was a environment or a social system where the males were competing heavily for females, right? Because that's usually under the conditions in which the males are larger. You see this with, you know, even lions and tigers and all sorts, even rhinos, all sorts of organisms that display dimorphism, or at least especially mammals, will have this sort of social standing. Now, moving on here, okay, you can see that the, uh, these early proboscideans split off into two main groups. You get the elephantiforms, which are the branch that eventually lead to mastodons and your gobbathiers and your elephants, and this other funky branch called plesia elephantiforms. Now, plesia elephantiforms were a bit different from what you see with your typical elephants, okay? Whereas you can understand why someone would mistake a mastodon for a true elephant. Uh, it's, if they were concerned the, or they mix these up with true elephants, you'd be a little bit concerned, right? Now, Momotherium here is a sort of semi-aquatic animal that is convergently uh, sort of evolved with tapirs. And the fact that they even had the short proboscis but what's interesting about these guys, okay, again, staying only in northern parts of Africa, is that their front teeth, whereas the other proboscideans, the earlier proboscideans, had incisors similar to most mammals, the, their incisors, their front teeth, started to push out, okay? And in fact, all the tusks that we see with mastodons and elephants and mammoths are essentially just really big buck teeth, okay? So we start to see these animals develop a more tusk-like structure in these skulls, and eventually with the later proboscideans, they will be pointing straight out of the mouth. And another thing that's interesting about these guys is that their teeth, while the earlier proboscideans were again, had more bunodont teeth, similar to most mammals, these guys start to develop those lobes, very general sort of aligned cusps in a row, laterally along their teeth, which I find super, super interesting. Now this really ugly guy right here, okay, I know they said we shouldn't insult them because they got thick skin, but they're sensitive. Uh, but I think most people will agree with me, he's not the most terribly beautiful looking of organisms, is Baratherium. And Baratherium was also a semi-aquatic animal, much significantly bigger, we're talking over six feet tall and multiple tons, and probably lived in existence uh, relatively similar to a hippo, although hopefully uh, for you know the other organisms in that ecosystem, a lot less homicidal. Okay. Now, this is of course was the Plesia elephantiform group. Around the same time, the elephantiforms 
developed a more terrestrial sort of lifestyle. And we see this with organisms like Pheomia and Paleomacina. Again, sticking to North Africa and around the same time, we're talking, you know, in the uh, around 30 to 37 million years ago, around that time frame. Now, of course, the reason why we're only seeing these proboscideans in Africa up to this point is because Africa, you know, up until the beginning of the Cenozoic, was mostly on its lonesome. And over time, Africa was essentially moving northward. You can see here that although proboscideans are awful good swimmers, that still, you know, multiple, multiple miles might be a little bit too far for a large organism like this to make it across an ocean, okay? And so, eventually what would happen is Africa would move further north, you see this purple part here would turn into the Arabian Plates, which would essentially connect Africa and Asia together. And this happened around 20 to 16 million years ago, and we actually see a large influx of proboscideans into Eurasia in an event called the Proboscidium Datum event. And this migration of proboscideans from Africa to Eurasia allowed for a large diversification of both the plesioelephantiforms and the elephantiform groups. Now, of course, a side effect of all these moving plates is that you have climate disruptions. Well, what exactly is the process behind these climate disruptions? Well, it turns out that there were several, you can see, uh, oceanic currents that were running in between these continents. And when you block those oceanic currents, you have a large change in climate. A great example of this is we have the Gulf Stream off the east coast of Florida, which brings warm water from the equator to the Mediterranean. If you blocked that oceanic current, the Mediterranean would be about as cold as Poland, if not parts of Russia. And so blocking and disrupting these oceanic currents can result in dramatic changes in climate, which is also a side effect of all these land bridges forming. And of course, this happens in both South and North America connecting, as well as Africa connecting with Eurasia through this uh, plate here, the Arabian plates. And this change uh, really happened, started sort of uh, getting into high gear around 10 million years ago up until the end of the ice ages. And during this time period, we saw dramatic uh, climate changes that happened at a much faster pace than what happened previously. And what we saw is that it, we saw a general cooling trend. These general cooling trends led to less of these aquatic environments that a lot of these early proboscideans were lighter. They were mostly semi-aquatic, except for a few species. And so you have a dramatic reduction in the sizes of these river floodplains, swamps, everything like that, and the expansion of grassland type environments. And this actually led to a lot of proboscideans not only becoming more terrestrial over time, but becoming more adapted to eating sort of more grassland type vegetation, like of course the aforementioned grass. <coughs> now, the Pleased Elephantiforms, of course, did follow this trend with the Dinotheres, a name that means terrible beast, and we can assume why they were named that. These guys, I feel like, really resemble uh, elephants from another world, at least to me, right? Because they're sort of, if you describe what an elephant is to an alien, and then they go ahead and try to draw one based off memory, uh, I imagine you get something like this. Now, Dinotheres, of course, uh, evolved a more terrestrial lifestyle than their earlier sub-aquatic ancestors, because, of course, as the cooling comes around, you get less of these sort of aquatic or wet and warm environments. And it starts out with Chogatherium. Chogatherium, 28 million years ago, was relatively small, right? It's just over a ton and a half. And, but eventually, they would develop into significantly bigger organisms like Dinotherium here. Dinotherium was over 13 feet tall, bigger than the world record African elephant, which stood 13 feet tall and 10 tons, or 10 and a half tons, okay? And so this guy was honestly, I believe it was top five, yeah, I believe it's one of the top five biggest proboscideans of all time. Now, many of you are probably thinking, what is up with those lower tusks, okay? We see that they don't have any upper tusks. What is the purpose of having those lower tusks? And that has actually been quite a, a debate for quite a while, and it still is a, you know, a pretty uh, strong debate between different scientists who study proboscideans. But... The common consensus as of right now is that they were used to help break up vegetation into smaller pieces. The wear patterns show that, well, there was a lot of vegetation rubbed up along the bottom of these tusks. And so what was probably happening is that they would grab something with this proboscis, with this trunk here, and whether it was a branch, it would be, you know, might have been too big for them to fit in their mouth. So what they do, drag it along the bottom here of this fork, snip it into a bite-sized piece, and shove it in their mouth. 
Now, of course, there's also another theory going around that these bottom tusks were as the animal was feeding in the tree, it, it sort of kept the branches out of the animal's face, right? But I feel like I personally, in my you know, completely unbiased opinion, uh, believe that you know, the bite-sized piece thing makes a little bit more sense to me, but you know, who knows? Now, <clears throat> another thing that was interesting about these organisms, as you can see, they're again developing this loaf-type structure. And even though they are not the direct ancestors of elephants, right, we believe that the climatic changes to these more grassland environments uh, sort of drove both dinotheres and the later elephants, mammoths, and mastodons to have a more, uh, say, less reliant on browse sort of diet. Now, getting back into the elephantiforms here, we then get into elephantomorpha which includes everything closer related to elephants uh, than, say, uh, the paleomastodontids, which includes mastodons. Now, mastodons, of course, are of course, a very, very popular proboscidean. And you can see that's because they're, well, pretty common here in Florida. People find a lot, a lot, a lot of these mastodon teeth. And in fact, we have a mastodon jaw right here. Now, what's interesting about these organisms, okay, is that, again, they're developing this loft-like structure, but they still retain these Bruno dot sort of uh, cusps on the top here until they get worn down, and then again, you know, you get this more uh, loaf-type structure. Now, Zygolophodon is one of the earliest mastodons, uh, getting, and it was also quite one of the largest, okay, reaching 13 and a half feet tall and 16 tons in weight. This was a very, very large animal, and it was also a very cosmopolitan animal living on several continents, including Africa, Eurasia, and North America. And it's believed that Zygolophodon was actually the direct ancestor of the Mamluts, or what we call the American Mastodons. Okay, now, of course, there are a couple of different species of Mastodons here in North America. The American Mastodons normally uh, on the East Coast, over in Florida, and everything like that is mostly what you're gonna find. But there's also the Pacific Mastodon, which has a couple differences in terms of teeth and skeletal structures and stuff like that but generally they're very, very similar. And Mammuts is, of course, the true genus name. Uh, Mastodon uh, was a, essentially a nomum dubium, uh, but because Mastodon was a popular name, most people just called them Mastodons, and it rolls off the tongue, I think, much better than Mammuts, right? And so, and this animal, again, actually survived until the end of the Ice Ages, around 11,000 years ago. Uh, and of course, just like every other animal that died at the end of the Ice Ages, was thought to be uh, killed off by a combination of human hunting and by climatic changes. And these guys, of course, uh, made it to parts of Central America, but they were not the type of proboscideans to make it into South America. That actual honor actually belongs to the next group called the Gothafeers. <laughs> And Galbathiers are a group of elephant relatives that are what we call pi pi paraphyletic, excuse me, paraphyletic, there we go, okay? Which just essentially means that they were ancestral to pretty much everything else on this family tree, okay? They were ancestral to elephants, they were ancestral to stegodonts, and of course to the shovel tuskers or the embelodontids, which we'll talk about in a minute. The Galbatherium is uh, one of the most common, uh, or most displayed in media of the Gompatheres, and they had these really long lower tusks, which were similar to Dimetherium, thought to be used sort of to, well, for a couple reasons, but to also chop up things into bite-sized pieces, but also for digging, scraping off pieces of bark, and things like that. Stegomastodon is a kind of animal that, well, sort of lacked a lot of this, or had severely reduced lower tusks. And it's thought that a reduction in these lower tusks, right, allow these organisms to browse lower, closer to the ground as an adaptation for this sort of more grassland kind of environment. Now, it's not saying that these animals were purely, or were purely grazers. In fact, they had a quite mixed diet, but it's thought that, you know, a reduction in these lower tusks helped not only for them to reach lower browse, but also realign the skeletal structure or the muscular structure in their skull to allow them to chew in a more efficient way that allowed to grind them real, or allowed them to grind up really tough plant materials like grasses, okay? Now, of course, a lot of questions I get uh, in relation to these animals is how you tell the difference between a mastodon tooth and a gompathier tooth. 
And here in North America, once you've looked at a couple of both, it starts to get relatively easy. If you go to the old world, it gets a little bit more complicated. Okay? But generally, what you're going to see here in Florida is you're going to see mastodonty that are zygodont, which means that these teeth, are, these cusps will line up in rows in which you know, you'll have these valleys in between them. Everybody see that? Whereas the gobbathiers, their teeth are a little bit more complex, right? They're, they still retain these general lows, but are rows, but they'll have tubercles in between these valleys, these lumps in between these valleys to give them a more sort of complex pattern. And even in the wear pattern, you can see, right? These mastodons, okay, it's kind of like straight across. It's relatively simple. Whereas the gobbathiers, it's like all over the place. It's a big mishmash in terms of a pattern. And they'll generally have this sort of Stray foil pattern here, at least the trilophodont gompathiers, right, which are one of the most common gompathiers you find here. You do find tetralophodont uh, gompathiers occasionally, but most of what you're going to be finding are going to have teeth like this. Now, moving on from these gompathiers, you of course get the embellidons, right? I These guys to me are funky looking. These are the shovel tuskers, okay? or at least what most people refer to as shovel tuskers. And depending on who you talk to, some people uh, lock them in with the gompathiers, okay? But the general consensus is that they're own, their own separate group, but instead they were descended directly from the gompathiers. Now, of course, platybelodon is a favorite of a lot of people. That's the one where you see the old paleo art of it, where they have the sort of wide, flat trunk that sits right on top of their, their lower jaw. Well, that's, it's kind of, not thought to actually be like that. Those were just really early constructions. I thought they had a more elephant-shaped tusk that's a little bit more round. And these guys were really the browsing specialists of the uh, of the elephant relatives, okay, of the proboscidean. Excuse me. It's because well, this extension of these lower jaws again allowed them to sort of scrape off pieces of bark and everything like that and chop up these pieces with a little bit less effort, a little bit less movement, and they made their feeding a lot more efficient when you had forests, when you had swamps, when you had a lot of high browsing material. And in fact, it's thought that that's the reason why these organisms uh, went extinct a lot sooner than the other proboscideans or a lot of the other big groups of proboscideans because Right, 10 million years ago and on, you have a reduction in these, you know, sort of browsing type environments and increase in grasslands. I sound like a broken record. I keep saying the same thing, but it's important because a severe reduction in these browsing environments and competition from more versatile proboscideans who can eat a wider variety of foods, like Asian elephants can eat grouse. In fact, about 50% of their diet is grouse, but they can also feed on grass if they want. Okay, so it's thought that cooling climates, in addition to competition from other proboscideans is what led to the shovel tuskers eventually going extinct. And one thing I did forget to mention with the gompathiers is that the ones that survived into the end of the ice ages were the ones without the lower tusks. They were the ones that had a head shape very similar to modern elephants. Okay, so that shows that having those lower tusks during the ice ages, not a great idea. Now, Finally, sort of getting even closer to the true elephants, I promise we'll get there in just another slide or two, we get the stegodonts. And stegodonts are thought to be the sister taxa to the elephantids or the true elephants. And we can actually see this both in sort of the structure of their teeth and in their general body shape. Okay? Now, of course, the stegodonts do have many, many lobes like we see with these elephants, but they still retain these caps. They still retain this glutodont type of cap to these lobes, okay? And so, this, these guys sort of were not North American at all, really. They were found only in the old world, whereas all the previous groups could be found in Africa and Eurasia and North America, or at least the ones uh, post proboscidean being of the vent, okay? And for the reason, the reason that is, I'm not terribly sure, right, that possibly that it was already saturated because by this, by the time these guys evolved, you already had mastodons, you already had gompathiers in North America. So it might just be possible that in the few times they did try to migrate over into North America, there was no niche space for them to fill. And when you already have an established population of an animal and you have an invader, in order for that invader to establish a population, they have to be significantly better at a certain niche than that animal that is already established. Right? That is actually why most invasions fail. 
And so every invasive species you see in Florida that is, you know, very uh, populous, that is, you know, very common, it was just playing better than the native species at whatever they're doing. Okay. Now, finally moving on to the true elephants, we of course get what everybody's favorite proboscidean is, or at least the grand majority of people, the mammoths. Now, of course, here you can see is a true as a mammoth tooth alongside an Asian elephant and an African elephant tooth, and then of course we got the the funky little mastodon tooth here. And mammoths were actually quite diverse. There were several different species that ranged in a variety of sizes. Of course, you also had the dwarf mammoths, like the uh, Chanel Island mammoth here, but you also had ones in the Mediterranean as well. That got even smaller than this. Followed by prim mammothus primigenius, or your woolly mammoth. Surprisingly, woolly mammoths are relatively small compared to most other mammoth species. They were really only about the size of Asian elephants, not getting much bigger than eight tons in weight. And then followed by the mammothus periodionalis, known as the southern mammoth, and then you have the Colombian mammoth, mammothus columbi, and the steppe mammoth, which was an animal that could get 14 feet tall and over 12 tons in weight. Big, big boy. Now, going into the sort of uh, the different elephant clades here. You, of course, have the Asian elephant clade and the African elephant clade. And, of course, with the Asian elephants, all right, the Asian elephant clade, of course, ends in the Asian elephant, which evolved a few million years ago, around th two to three million years ago. But you also get the mammoths, starting with, of course, your African mammoths around six million years ago, which would then eventually develop into another species of African mammoth. Followed by the Romanian mammoth, which was unsurprisingly discovered in Romania. And this sort of demonstrates that these mammoths actually had a significant, uh, a much later migration out of Africa than the early proboscideans did. Okay? The Africa was sort of the diversification center of proboscideans, very you know, similar to uh, hominid species. You had most of your different hominid genera here, or not here, but in Africa, where they diversified and would migrate out to other continents. And proboscideans were very similar in this regard. And we can see this plainly with the mammoths. And in fact, you can see here that many of these different species, this isn't all of them, okay, it's just a grand majority of them, that a good amount of these sort of diversified outside of Africa, which was unusual for a lot of these proboscideans. And in fact, the Colombian mammoth and the woolly mammoth represent two different migrations of the steppe mammoth to North America. Okay. The first migration of steppe mammoths, or at least the first ones that are recorded in the fossil record, was around a million and a half years ago across the Beringian Land Bridge, which was, of course, connecting Siberia to Alaska. And these guys would eventually sort of migrate south into warmer climates, lose this, or at least we believe would lose this thick fur that a lot of steppe mammoths had, and sort of be more adapted to warmer environments, which is why we find mammoth teeth in Florida in the first place. If you find a mammoth tooth here in Florida, it's not a woolly mammoth, no matter what a lot of these public articles will tell you, it is a Colombian mammoth, okay? And the woolly mammoths actually came from a, a migration that was around, I think, 400,000 years ago, either 400 or 500,000 years ago, uh, of a second migration of steppe mammoth, in which they already had several established proboscidean populations in the southern parts, so in the United States and south, and so they became better adapted to the northern latitudes uh, in the mammoth steppe, so think Canada and Siberia and everything like that. So that just sort of shows how speciation and diversification works, and proboscideans are actually excellent for demonstrating these sort of phenomena. Now, if we go to the African elephant clade, we of course get African bush elephant on one, and then the African forest elephant on the other. And the African forest elephant is the smallest of the living elephants, or the living proboscideans, but it was related to the biggest. The straight tusked elephant. The straight tusked elephant, based on fragmentary material, as was mentioned, could reach over 17 feet tall and is estimated at 22 tons. Jeez. This is a mammal that is estimated, there's a high error chance for this, is estimated to be bigger than some sauropod dinosaurs. And the, of course, for those of you who don't know, sauropod dinosaurs are the big, long neck ones like Diplodocus and like Brachiosaurus. Okay? And in fact, if we take a look at some of the biggest of the proboscideans, 
Two of them are different types of straight tusked elephants. That, of course, being the Asian and the European straight tusked elephant, which are estimated to be 22 to 15 tons, respectively. Now, of course, in the middle there, you get Zygolophodon, which, of course, is a mastodon. And take a, note, take a look about how 13 and a half feet tall, and you don't get a 13 and a half footer until number five. So this just shows that the number two spot belongs to a mastodon, and they're also one of the shortest on this list. It just shows that these mastodons were very robust, very muscular, and very meaty. And of course, you get your Dinotherium here, your Step Mammoth, your Stegodon, and then finally your Columbian Mammoth, right, is down at the bottom there. Now, of course, we covered a lot of different groups, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and sort of show you guys. Uh, or give you guys a little bit of a review of the migration paths of these different groups. The Diplesia elephantiforms, okay, which include things like Monotherium here, but also Dinotherium, originated with one of the earliest of the uh, Procidians to branch off around 56 million years ago, migrated to Eurasia during the Procidium datum events around 20 to 16 million years ago, and then finally went extinct about 1 million years ago. Probably is a combination, again, of climatic changes and competitions are from competition from other proboscideans. Probably, namely, a lot of the true elephants that migrated out of Africa around three million to one million years ago. And this is sort of a, a pattern we see with a lot of different organisms, including the mastodons. Mastodons, of course, originated around 25 to 27 million years ago, made the same proboscidean day of event migration, and then migrated into North America around 16 million years ago where they lasted until the end of the Ice Ages, around 11,000 to 12,000 years ago. The Old World species, however, went extinct around 3 million years ago. That's interesting because that's around the same time that these true elephants came right out of Africa. Okay, that's also around the time where we start, start seeing you know, hominids. Now, of course, hominids probably weren't hunting proboscideans at 3 million year point. That's probably much later, right? But it's just they sort of just shows that around three million years ago you're getting multiple species. There's a sudden burst of reserve versification and migration out of Africa. Okay, and hominids still alter environments in other ways besides from just directly hunting these proboscides. Okay. Now, sort of moving on to the Gompathiers here. Gompathiers, very similar story. They survived a little bit later on, in, uh, around one million years ago in the old world. However, as I said before. Their refugia, instead of being, you know, uh, the North America, they were also had refugia in South America. They, for some reason, they were the only proboscidean we know of to fully make it into South America. Okay, the reason for that, who knows? Maybe it's because they had a little bit more of a diverse diet than the mastodons. Mastodons were, they could eat some some grass, right? But it was very tough on their teeth, and the extra more complex teeth of these gompathiers probably allowed them to have a more versatile diet. Especially when you consider the gompathiers that did make it into South America were not the ones with the really long tusks, but animals like Nodium mastodon that lacked these lower tusks and had a more elephant-style head shape that allowed them to be, well, more versatile. And of course the Umbelodonts, these guys were, well, I don't want to say losers, but in terms of proboscideans, they were kind of the losers of all these groups, okay? Uh, they certainly, we have no idea where they originated. They just kind of show up in all three places around 17 million years ago. We know they do make it into North America around 10 million years ago, which, and then they last for another 5 million years, which is certainly very good in the broad scheme of things, uh, but not for proboscideans, right? They go extinct shortly after they arrive. I say shortly, I say 5 million years is a long time. Uh, again, because probably of climatic changes and because of competition from organisms like gompatheaters and mastodons. Because by this point, of course, the mammoths haven't shown up yet. Stegodontids, okay, another group. They never made it into North America, right? Showed up around 16 to 15 million years ago and went extinct uh, at the end of the Ice Ages. And then finally, the mammoths. We, of course, get the first, or I should say the elephants, the first elephants. The first true elephants originated around 10 million years ago, migrated into Eurasia 3 million years, which is around the same time a lot of other proboscideans went extinct, okay, in the old world. And then the mammoths are the ones that made it into North America, as I said, through to separate migration events. Probably multiple, but two that are marked in the fossil record. Of course, one, oh wow, that was really long. So okay, so 800,000 years ago is 
where we get the migration that leads to woolly mammoths. Oopsies. Okay. We all made a mistake, guys. Okay. Well. <laughs> and so these mammoths, okay, are thought to have outcompeted a lot of the gopotheres around this time and a lot of the mastodons. For some reason, uh, the mastodons were able to survive alongside mammoths, probably because mammoths were more grazers than, like, say, modern elephants. And thus, you know, they sort of stayed a lot more distinct, whereas the mastodons stuck mostly to browsing habitats and that niche there. The mammoths mostly stuck to grazing, whereas the gopotheres were sort of a mix of both. So the mammoths would compete more with the gopotheres than they would with the mastodons, generally. Okay? Now, of course, all of these extinctions were probably, of course, facilitated by both climate and human hunting. What you see right here is how we believe Paleo Indians use something called an atlatl, or a spear thrower, in which they have essentially an extension of the arm that allows a more centrifugal force to throw a spear or a dart with a lot more efficiency, a lot more accuracy, and a lot more power than you would just with your shoulder joint. Okay? It's sort of like if you, you anybody have those little arm things where you throw tennis balls, right? It works the same exact way, right? You could throw a tennis ball a lot further than with that than you could with just your shoulder. These sort of work the same exact way. And this was a development by Homo sapiens, which is our species. Homo neanderthals certainly did hunt proboscideans, but it's thought to be a lot less efficiently, probably because their shoulder joint was not quite as good as ours for throwing, and because, well, they didn't have these sort of inventions uh, that we had, okay? Probably a result of, you know, us living in much bigger sort of family groups than the other people. When you have more people working together, you're able to develop better sort of ways of doing things and better inventions and stuff like that, okay? That's not to say Neanderthals are stupid. Neanderthals are thought to be just as smart as us, but when you live in smaller groups, it's harder to get things done. Right? And let that be a lesson to everybody, okay? <laughs> Work together and be nice. I think Neanderthals uh, actually hunted uh, humans. Well, yeah, I mean, it's... I heard some recent developments. Yeah, I mean, that's, there's some talk about that. They also ate each other, as did Homo sapiens, if we want to, you know, talk about that. It's, it's, it's hard to say one species definitely predated on the other, or more so that hominids are just mean to each other, and we're omnivores, so if we kill something, we'll eat it, unless there's some sort of social stigma behind it. Let's just agree that humans of all species can be massive jerks. Absolutely. I mean... I don't think anybody's going to disagree with that. If an, el if an animal is intelligent, it's probably a jerk. Look at dolphins. Okay? Oh, God. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Horrifying. Yes. Elephants and probe scenes. Talk about going from cute to not cute the more you learn about it. Yeah, I know. Sharks get all the hate, but dolphins are the real jerks of the ocean. Okay? Orcas are technically dolphins, and they'll flip a shark over, beat it up for a couple hours, and then eat the liver and leave. Right? That sounds wasteful to me, right? Anyway, and plus you have the whole worker thing where they're now destroying, you know, the rudders of boats just because they find it funny. Right? <laughs> you know, if, if you have a couple of teenage guys and they could destroy a couple boats, they probably do that as well, right? So, anyway, getting back on task here. <laughs> this is one of the bad things about inviting me, okay? I tend to go on tangents. I've been very good up until this point. Anyway, now, of course, there were a few groups of Procyonians that actually survived after the end extinction of the Ice Ages. And these groups were typically uh, the dwarf uh, versions of these different uh, groups of proboscideans. And of course, pretty much all the proboscidean groups that are, well, I shouldn't say that. Anything that is a elephant or a true elephantid has uh, a dwarf version. This, of course, includes the straight tusked elephants, this includes the mammoths, and even, you know, your. Uh, your true our modern elephants, okay? And in fact, you remember Paleomastodon, or no, excuse me, not Paleomastodon, Paleoloxodon, the straight tusked elephant, the one of the larger species of proboscideans, also has a species that's one of the smallest, as you can see here. This is Paleoloxodon falconeri, okay? It's about the size of a law of a really large dog. Which is, and you can see, the calf is about cat size. Wouldn't that just be the hugest freaking thing? <laughs> yeah, a little, little baby elephant about this big. It's like, oh, just like, you know. <laughs> anyway, and it's thought that this island dwarfism, of course, island dwarfism is a phenomenon in which individuals over several generations reduce their size because there's typically less food available on islands and, you know, there's usually less predatory, uh, you know, crushers, and so they typically develop significantly smaller sizes. Of course, when you have predators that then show up, 
uh, on boats with spears and, you know, have lost all the big elephants and everything on the mainland. So, you know, they're like, ooh, bite size. Okay. <laughs> and, yeah, there you go, right? Um, they're perfectly sized for a nice spit roast. And so eventually, you know, once humans made it to all these islands, they would end up going extinct. Now, the reason why a lot of these elephants were so prone to being on the dwarfs is because they're very good swimmers. Okay, they are very buoyant because they got a lot of volume for their surface area, and they've got a built-in snorkel. Okay, and if you guys have ever, if you haven't seen elephants swimming, uh, look it up. It's they're very funny looking. Okay? <laughs> now, unfortunately, right, there are still elephants around today, and there are still proboscideans around. But we're doing our best to make sure they're not. Okay? They tend to develop or grow a very valuable resource on their faces. Uh, you know, and whenever you have a very valuable resource in or around you, humans will kill you to, of course, make use of that valuable resource. And this is so this is such a hard pressure on these populations that many uh, different populations of elephants are actually losing tusks. They are evolving in front of our eyes to not develop tusks because the benefits of having tusks for feeding and for competition are outweighed by not having tusks, meaning you're probably not going to get shot by a poacher. Okay? And it's the same thing we see with rattlesnakes. A lot of rattlesnakes are stopped, are not rattling anymore because if you rattle, a human's going to find you and, it's going to kill, and they're going to kill you. Right? And so it just shows that evolution happens on a shorter time scale sometimes than <coughs> what was originally proposed. And regardless, okay, regardless of whether they have tusks or not, they are in trouble. Not just from poaching, not just from, say, human conflicts, because of course you have a herd of elephants that come in and eat everything on your farm, you're gonna be pretty dang upset about it, right? Especially if, well, your livelihood is made off of agriculture. And so you're not gonna care that these animals are endangered. You killing them means your family gets to eat. And so a lot of this is where a lot of this human conflict comes from, aside from poaching, and plus, because human populations are continuously expanding, as we're apparently very good at doing, uh, we are, of course, reducing their habitat. In places where we have uh, you know, these reserves in which we have wide tracts of land, elephants are doing pretty good, right? Where they're not being encroached upon, but in areas where they are, elephant populations are steadily declining, and they, are they will probably continue to do so. Up until the only elephants we have left are within these reserves. So, these are all the papers and books that I read in order to start this and finish this presentation. I'll now be happy to take questions. Uh, how about Atticus Dodd? Mississippi to North Mississippi and I like the way that it's got the indentation on there and the actual fossil on there so it fits perfectly together <coughs> and that is all I have for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Super Dave. At, uh, since it's cold and the water's deep, this isn't from the last month. But, uh, but it's Mammoth Night, which is my favorite night. Uh, I found this a couple years ago. This is Mammoth. And I'm quite sure it's Mammoth because I found it too, not too far from where I found this. So what is this? It's bird brain. The, the centrum would be down here. Don't ask me which one. I want to say Tory Edge, but I'm not sure. Is it? It's a big, it's a big bird. Uh, this is a sternum uh, elephant, but we don't know what. It was just by itself. And it's extremely light, so you'll find fossils are not always heavy. Uh, and I got, uh, brought some skull cap in case anybody was wanted to see what the inside of a mammoth skull looks like. It's full of pockets. 
and uh, two kneecaps. I do have kneecaps. Uh, found them in the same, almost the same exact spot, but a year apart. So they might go together, but I don't know. And this, I just thought this was neat. It's a mammoth. Uh, I found it in pieces. It took a long time to glue it all together. It looks like hell, but uh, it had really severe arthritis. I just thought it looked cool. Is that a knee? No, the vertebrae. I'm sorry, the vertebrae. But it was just lots of pieces. Whenever I find lots of pieces, I just pick them all up and see if they'll look like they'll go together. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Sometimes you got junk. Yeah. Can we leave these here or leave? I would leave that one there. No, I know. It's fragile. Oh, it's fragile. Thank you, Dave. I broke it twice. Mike Davis. So, who here is interested in petrified wood? Ah, a lot of people like petrified wood. I got a, I got a big chunk of petrified wood here. Found it in Wyoming, east of Guernsey, Wyoming. Uh, there's a little bit of a story behind it. Uh, Leslie and I, my wife, we, we follow this guy on Facebook who goes fossil uh, um, rock hounding, actually, in Wyoming all the time. And after following him for quite a while and hints about where he was going and much looking on Google Earth. I happened to be out in Wyoming to go uh, weather weatherproof our place out there. Unfortunately, Leslie couldn't come along. So I dedicated a day to going out to where this guy's been going and looking around. And I only have the general area. I don't know exactly where he hunts, but he finds amazing stuff. And you know, I got out there late in the day and within 15 minutes, I found this big chunk of petrified wood, a bunch of smaller pieces, agates, um, banded iron, jasper, um, just amazing. And uh, I went back the next day and basically loaded the truck. Um, I found two other logs of petrified wood bigger than this. I brought this one back because this would fit in a, uh, a post office, you know, box that I could bail back, you know, the, uh, the ones they have. The others are in our rock garden in Wyoming. So, uh, we're going back there this spring, and we're going to spend a couple days out there in that area rock hounding. I'll leave this up here if anybody's interested. And Marlon, I'm going to donate this for the silent auction. So you can take this with you. So, um, a little bit of a story behind these. Um, I acquired them a couple years ago. Uh, I am a uh, fossil dealer, and when I got these, my first inclination was, I need some verification because the person I got them from didn't really seem to know much, but the information that he was giving me was very interesting. Uh, his claim was that they were Mastodon and that they were from Ecuador, which I had no experience with and did not know anyone who did. After some searching online, I eventually determined that they were Gomphothere and have had them in the back because I don't want to sell something that I do not have as much information on as possible. And I found out, oh, there's someone here tonight who's doing a whole thing on proboscideans. Let me bring it here because the Floridians are probably also going to just in general know much more about proboscidean fossils than where I used to live back in Texas. And so far I've gotten lots, the more or less the confirmation that I was hoping to get. And yeah, um, the speaker mentioned that they could be from a genus called Nodiomastodon, who unfortunately did not have the bottom tusks. I also realize some of you might not know what a gomphothier is. The best way I can describe it, and you'll probably see some pictures of it later on tonight, is like an alien elephant. Uh, <laughs> I'm not really sure. It, it, imagine an elephant, but with just the worst underbite in the history of all of existence, maybe the entire universe, who knows? I honestly, even if we ever do get really good at space exploration, I'm not sure we'll ever find something with worse underbite than those things. It's basically just uh, a mammoth with a shovel on space. Bingo. Um, speaking of Texas and gomphotheres, there's actually, in the Houston Museum of Natural Science, a wonderful display there of a full-size megalodon jaw 
chasing after a uh, replica of a swimming gomphotheer. And there's a picture of a reconstruction of that on the side. So you'll have, in this picture, this gomphotheer with the full shovel bottom jaw being chased in the water by this giant megalodon. And the thing is, its head is poking out of the water, probably screaming who knows what. <laughs> and that's probably one of my favorite pictures at the, at the museum. Anyway, so yeah. Uh, hopefully th these can help with the presentation a little bit. Um, yeah, that's really all I have to say on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. I mean, all right. So I, I didn't bring the really nice uh, Mako tooth that I found at the fossil farm. I left it in my display cabinet. Oh my! Two years later. But I did go scuba diving on Saturday. It was very cold, 64 degrees, mm. but I got a pretty nice, almost three inch ma uh, mag from it. And uh, it actually mm. has the burlet and almost every serration, just a little teeny tiny feeding damage on the tip as usual. But I thought it was a pretty nice tooth. So I thought I'd bring it on uh, for now here and show you guys, so. Yay. <laughs> And you can see her Mako in the newsletter. That's a huge, huge route for Mako. Mr. Heine, Steve, this is going to be one of the beat up at the fossil farm. Yes. <laughs> Nobody would go to lunch with him afterwards. The guy that got lucky there. A three and a half inch mag in perfect condition. Wow. Nice. Wow. <laughs> The picture of the newsletter does not do that justice. It's not missing a single it's serration. The, the, I don't think the enamel's cracked. It's it's as perfect of a mag as you can find. It's yeah, right we're selling Riker mounts right behind you there. So they carry in your pocket with your keys. <laughs> Unless I miss somebody, that just leaves you, Joe. So uh, I've been going to Peace River recently, and while they aren't all that common don't really have to go to the Bone Valley Farm. Though I hope my name will end up on this list. I missed the last one. <laughs> you can still find really nice teeth in nice. Peace River. That one came straight out of a Shelly clay marl. So it's got nice like silver and tan colors. Same thing with this Mako. It's got like a striped, right? It's got a nice stripe pattern to it with alternating tans and blue colors. It's definitely my favorite Mako. A few other big shark's teeth from the past few trips to Peace River. A couple of them have some dings. Uh, but a few months ago, I found uh, an associated pair of lower mammoth teeth along with the uh, a big tusk. And I went back to that spot with the river being a little bit higher and I got an upper tooth to a different mammoth than the original one that I found. But that's the developing upper tooth. I also got the younger tooth that's in front of it. So these go together like that. Wow. And eventually this tooth would push forward and this smaller tooth would be spit out. So that was exciting. So there's a second mammoth in that spot, but then also up around the bend from that, I found there's a third mammoth in that spot because this big upper tooth isn't associated with these uppers. And I really doubt given the location it came from and the condition <laughs> it's in, it's associated with the original two lowers that I found three months ago. So I'm now working on three elephants out of maybe about a 50 yard stretch of river. So that's exciting. That's awesome. This table's going to collapse. You know, we're going to get some out. Back by popular demand, <laughs> our guest, our guest, the creature game. 
Are you ready? Yeah. Yes. Okay, give me a quarter so I can start the game. What? A quarter. <laughs> Hello again, and welcome to our prehistoric party. It'll be your job tonight to identify our special guest of honor, who quite literally stands heads and shoulders above the rest. Okay, okay, easy now, easy now. Watch the chandelier. I'm watching, I'm watching. Bit of a tight squeeze. I'm more used to wide open spaces, you know, like the open desert plains of Mongolia. Mongolia, eh? That's a pretty far to come from. Nothing I'm not used to. My long legs help me to cover long distances, especially in the search for food. Well, of course, you must be hungry after that long journey. I can get you some grass if you like. Ugh, no grass, please. I much prefer leaves. I'm a browser, you see. I even have a prehensile lip to gather them. <laughs> that also explains the long neck. So you're like a giant giraffe? Oh, believe it or not, I'm more closely related to rhinoceroses. You can tell by the shape of my skull. Rhinos? You don't have a horn. Well, when you're as big as I am, not that many predators would dare to give you trouble. You can't argue with that. So, can you guess who our mystery guest is? Let's review the clues. He lived in what is now Mongolia in an arid desert environment. He has long legs and can travel long distances without food or water. He has a prehensile upper lip to gather leaves. And in spite of his appearance, he is closely related to rhinos. And he's one of the largest land mammals known to have existed. Who is he? Yes. How do you zoom out? I got you. <laughs> I didn't figure that. Yeah, no worries about it. Uh, he is. So who is he? Come on, everyone, Where's say it. Right that is me. I know this one. I'm Ericeratherium transorlicum, the near orless beast. And I can proudly say that unlike some of my cousins, my head does not come to a point. And considering your size, that's reassuring. Anyways, there should be fun, some leaves around back. Now, just wait here while I food! Charge! No, stop, not through there! Cue sounds of various glass objects breaking. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Sorry, ground bit over <clears throat> excited. Oh, nothing too long ago, rock broke. This china was priceless. Oh, that's a relief. For a moment, I thought something expensive got wrecked. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again for attending our prehistoric party. Be sure to join us next time. Note to self next time, host a larger guest outside. Gee, you think? <laughs> So, parasitic theory. Yeah, I know he's not an elephant, but this is the rhino equivalent of an elephant. Now, like some of you said, this animal was known by several other names, like Indricotherium and Volusiotherium. But since Paraceratherium was the name that was coined first, that's the proper name. And this animal, well probably stood about 15 feet high at the shoulder. So imagine how high his head would have been. Now some prehistoric elephants may have come close to reaching its size, but due to fragmentary remains, this is what I consider to be the biggest animal around. He existed on Earth during the Oligocene Epoch during the Paleogene period, roughly 34 to 23 million years ago. And even though it doesn't have an arm, do you think you'd want to mess with something this big? No. No. Even if he is a plant eater. And ironically, it may have been the introduction of proboscideans migrating into Asia, along with climate change that probably spelled the end to the Paraceratherium, which is a shame. 
I would have liked to see a hornless rhino. What do we even call hornless rhinos anyway? They don't have nose horns. That's a pretty odd conundrum, isn't it? <laughs> but there you have it. The largest land mammal known to science. And one of my personal favorite prehistoric mammals, Indrik, the Paraceratherium. Thank you. Thank you.